Can you quickly mail the bio here? Sorry, yeah, I'll do that. Sanae, so use your hotspot. Sanae, so use your hotspot from your phone. Okay, then I can try and log in from my phone itself and I'll disconnect this one. You can I'll have your video oh, fine. on. Fine. Let's just move on. Okay. Let's move on. We can go on and on like that. Sarah, just start the event. And if uh, Sana can't do it, then Mamta will do All right. Okay. Yeah, we're good everywhere. We're streaming now. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Anuradha Zayo. All right. Shall I begin? Yeah, yeah, already live. I, I okay. just went live. All right. Good afternoon. On behalf of Upanagar Shikshan Mandal's Kamda Reheja, Vidyanidhi Institute for Architecture and Environmental Studies, I welcome all of you on the third day of the Kamda Reheja Memorial Lecture Series, supported by the Kamda Reheja Foundation. For those of us who were unable to attend and are unfamiliar with the events that took place in the last two days, the KRMLS this year is centered around a theme called as an Apocalypse Manifesto. A sequence of events have been planned throughout the year, and the first event that was opened out was with a series of electives, followed by a keynote lecture by Ola Borman on finding measure by architecture. The second lecture, titled as a director's talk, had our former director, Anirudh Paul, and our present director, Manoj Parmal, establish the importance and relevance of architectural education envisioning the school's position and trajectories in situating architectural education and practice. Finally, the dissertation colloquium that was held yesterday and extends today brings in the discussion around theses by the 2019-2020 uh, batch of graduates. This colloquium addresses new forms and types of architectural practice by drawing out crucial and critical thoughts and ideas around architecture. We have with us three practitioners and academicians, namely Shomitra Ghosh, Dr. Anuradha Chatterjee, and Yon Konyan, representing the space of academics, practice, and allied fields, who will respond to these new notions and concepts around architecture. I would now like to invite my colleague Sanaya, Sanaya Vandrevala to introduce Yon Konyan, who will be speaking to us shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me begin by introducing our first guest for the afternoon. Uh, Jan Konyan is an architecture and design curator and a writer based in Amsterdam. He has curated several exhibitions, such as the Unsolicited Architecture for the International Architecture Biennale of Sao Paulo 2011, the award-winning Housing with the Mission exhibition for the Urbanism Architecture by City Biennale of Hong Kong and Shenzhen, 2011 and 2013. In 2015, he was appointed as the curator of the fifth Brazilian design Biennale. Jan has also curated the official Dutch cultural program during the Olympic Games of Rio de Janeiro, 2016. Currently, he is the head of program of the Dutch Design Week, the largest in Northern Europe, a senior design researcher at Art Easy School of Arts in Arnhem, and a PhD candidate at the Technical University Edenhoven with a dissertation on exhibition of architects Aldo and Han Van Eyck. Jan has also recently completed a feature documentary on architecture, Professor Max Rizalda, entitled Max Rizalda, Life, Works and Twelve Buildings. It's a pleasure to welcome Jan at KRVI. Jan, over to you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for tuning in today. Um, it's uh, it's winter and grey and rainy here in Amsterdam, um, but um, it's it's very nice to connect to to Mumbai. And unfortunately, cannot be there physically, but it's uh, it's great to be uh, with you guys uh, digitally. I'm gonna try to share my screen to start my presentation. Uh, let me see if that works. Can you see it all right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so this presentation I'd like to name um, Curating Architecture and Design in two acts. Um, I think it would be nice to uh, to start off a little bit by um, explaining uh, about my own practice. Um, some works I've been doing that you heard in the introduction as well, um, which is which I would like to call uh, What to Tell and How to Tell. And the second act, I would like to explore 
the past and uh, and to let you know where I uh, I find my inspiration from, which is mostly focused on the PhD I'm doing at the moment, which was already told in the introduction about uh, Aldo and Honey van Eyck's uh, exhibition work. Um, so that's how I'd like to um, to structure my uh, presentation. Um, I I do not have an architectural uh, uh, graduation. I did not study architecture. I studied film. But somehow I ended up in this field of, of curating exhibitions and uh, that started somewhat in 2008-2009 when I met Ole Baumann who uh, gave the key lecture, um, I think it was Thursday, and he gave me the opportunity to, um, to start working on exhibitions. Um, I had no clue how to do that, but I did have an idea of the exhibitions that I liked. So my first response was to uh, simply kind of imagine what an architectural exhibition would look like and start to kind of aim for that. So this is the Architecture Museum in Rotterdam where I started off. And this is the very first exhibition I did, which was about a Brazilian architect called Jean Figueres Lima. Uh, most people call him Lele, maybe some of you know him. And he, uh, he specialized in, uh, in hospitals, in schools. He has a quite social agenda. So um, the exhibition was called Architect of Health and Happiness. And what I did basically kind of uh, study the work, research the work, uh, find out what I found interesting and see how that translates into uh, to an exhibition. Uh, quite standard, just panels uh, with uh, some models, uh, ground plans, uh, just to kind of explain uh, his work, which is not that well known to, uh, to a large group of people. Um, here are just some, uh, some of the models, um, some of the shots of the opening. And um, of course, this I think was very interesting to do, uh, and and as a first exhibition, it was quite uh, quite a task, and uh, it was quite sc scary in that sense. Uh, but after that, I really started to get a, a feel for it, and I thought it I thought it would be interesting to see if I could experiment more with exhibitions. So um, I was wondering if I could create more of my own content, and I was also wondering if an exhibition can be more than just exhibit work. Can it be, for instance, a workspace? Um, and this started with a commission that uh, I got when I still worked at the Netherlands Architecture Museum for um, an exhibition in Sao Paulo, at the uh, International Architecture Biennale in Brazil. Uh, and we decided to um, uh, program that exhibition around the idea of unsolicited architecture. This was in 2011, when there was very little work for architects. And I was slightly bothered with the somewhat passive approach that Dutch architects had. They were kind of waiting for the phone to ring for, uh, for jobs. And I thought, no, architects should maybe be much more active and should go out there uh, to search for work. Um, so one of the things we did was to kind of first kind of create uh, the content of the exhibition itself. I believe very much that architects can do a lot with very little and that even with a bucket of paint, you can make a difference. And some might not consider this architecture, but I do think this is a, an intervention in, in public space and therefore a design task. And, and uh, therefore, I think it uh, fitted very well um, in, in the idea of, uh, of what we were trying to aim. Uh, this was also in Sao Paulo in quite a bad neighborhood. We just uh, invited architects to do very small uh, interventions, uh, work with uh, the, the people from the neighborhood uh, and improve this. The second one we did was uh, we gave uh, a group of architects uh, um, uh, some um, umbrellas to create their own structure. This is a temporary structure in the middle of Rotterdam where we created a bar. Uh, just with some umbrellas, and we partied uh, all night there. So all these uh, programs and all these type of uh, projects ended up in the exhibition called uh, Unsolicited Architecture, which I did with, uh, with Ola as well, and we invited two uh, Brazilian curators for this as well. And the, the way it translated um, had to be very kind of active in my ID. So it, it would not be, um, let's say, a very static exhibition, but it should be a place where uh, we would uh, really invite audience to, um, to, to act, to read, to do things. Of course, we had uh, the, the post-its. <clears throat> At this moment, I, uh, <clears throat> I would never ever do this anymore, but at that time I thought it was a very kind of interactive approach uh, where we would ask um, uh, people visiting about, um, about their work, about their life, about uh, uh, their transit. We had a manifesto, of course, uh, and I really wanted it to become a space where architects would work and to show this. Um, so really messy, not what you kind of expect with an exhibition. Um, the exhibition also traveled around, which is quite interesting as well. How do you deal with that if it uh, would go to a different space uh, in a different 
city with different type of um, problems. Uh, can an exhibition in that sense kind of breathe in and breathe out, take on new projects? This is, I think, an interesting notion as well. I travel to the north of Brazil as well. Now, the third <coughs> exhibition I would like to show here is um, the, the question that kind of triggered me as well, how to build further on the idea of cultural exchange. I'd been, uh, I'd had this experience in Brazil. I thought it was quite interesting. Of how do architects relate to each other in, in an international context? Is it just Dutch architects going to Brazil and kind of showing their best work? Or can we come to a, a specific type of dialogue and how to address social issues in this? So uh, this project maybe was shown by Ole as well. I'm not too sure. I, I did this with Ole. It was a project for the uh, Shenzhen um, Architecture Biennale. Um, in 2013, um, and it was based on a social housing project we did with five Chinese architects and five Dutch architects, in which they all had to design uh, a specific housing block dealing with uh, with uh, social issues and uh, lower income housing in uh, in China. Now, this was the project, uh, and the idea was to translate this in um, in an exhibition, uh, which uh, um, the poster looked like this: housing with a mission. And this is what it ended up looking like. I, I imagine these kind of big doll houses, and I think uh, the audience really liked it. Everybody wanted to uh, to be on a photo with uh, with those works. Um, it was quite a large scale exhibition for me, um, and I think it was quite successful. Just going through uh, some of the images here, um, we also recreated a, a house uh, inside the exhibition. How a Dutch a uh, person with low income would live and, uh, and a, a Chinese uh, person with low income would live. The reading table as well, this kind of active approach that I always like. This was the whole team working on it. Uh, and we were surprised that it actually won the first prize of the, of the Biennale that year. And out of that uh, came the invitation of, uh, of the, the complete uh, Biennale in, that was 2013, which I did with Ola, which I'm sure Ola showed as well. And this was really the large scale. And our biggest biggest task was there how to bring alive this large scale. So this was the 2013 um, Urbanism Architecture Biennale in Shenzhen. Uh, this was the site, uh, industrial site, completely run down. Uh, and we had to kind of uh, be uh, the architects of this site to create it into uh, to a museum um, or a Biennale site and to program it. The site looked like this. So a lot of work had to be done in, uh, in a short time. But of course, we had to kind of vision as well, like how would it look like and how to give value to uh, to this site, which at this stage uh, really had uh, very little value. We invited a team of uh, 10 architects from all over the world, also from India. Shantinu Puredi was a part of the design process because we really wanted to make it an uh, international uh, design um, and not just Chinese architects and not just Dutch architects. So just flipping through some of the, the works um the the statement that we made and uh, the end result uh, this is some of the interventions we did to improve the the building some of the outside one new building which was interesting because uh originally the client wanted to destroy the whole site and have only new buildings we really wanted to save the the structure that was there because we saw the quality of it in it and this is what it ended up looked like we invited a large number of um, curators, uh, designers, architects to um, to create exhibitions there. Uh, this was the one of Droog Design. This was the one of Columbia University, of VNA, uh, of OMA, um, and of MoMA. And one of the lessons I think I've learned from that is that not only if you invite uh, uh, well-known and high-quality partners that you always get a good uh, result. This was the exhibition that MoMA did, four tables. I thought it was uh, uh, quite disappointing, to tell you the truth. So it really um, uh, made me realize that you always have to be on top of uh, who you invite and uh, what they do. And we had a, a series of talks. But I think one of the most interesting things that we tried to do was really make this site come alive. This was the outside. We created an urban garden out of it and started to program this as well. So we had harvesting events. We had sowing events to really kind of promote good and healthy and natural uh, food uh, uh, in this region. Um, and at a certain moment, the site became so popular um, that it became a popular site for uh, marriage uh, photography. 
um, we try to program it with uh, musical events. This was like a song contest um, with uh, sport events for kids with uh, another type of uh, competition. So I think what, what was really uh, what we really learned from this is that um, it takes a lot of effort, but I think it's, it's very valuable to not only to, sh to make exhibitions to create value in that sense, but also to really program it and to make it come alive. And uh, this is what I always try to do um, in my exhibition work. Um, now from China, I went to back to Brazil. How to deal with a sensitive history in 2015? I became the curator for the fifth design Biennale, uh, fourth design Biennale of Brazil, um, and of course, the, this was the location. The original idea was for them to um, to have a simple exhibition of design works, but I started to look at the history of the site um, of this building that I showed, and I found out that it was quite crucial in the overthrowing of the dictatorship in Brazil. There was a dictatorship in Brazil from 67 to 84. And the overthrowing and the going to democracy started with this picture. Uh, here you see the, the general at that time and a little girl refused to shake his hand, uh, which led to kind of an uprising in the small city. And the uprising in the small city led to, um, to uh, the democracy uh, several years later, to many protests. So this is really kind of a crucial site in, uh, in Brazilian history. So I thought you should really relate to that. Here you see still uh, during the dictatorship uh, and the visit of the general to this building. So this, this building was very crucial and I wanted to go beyond just showing some design works uh, of Dutch designers. But of course the, the client really wanted that and the client was a little bit hesitant to really uh, deal with such political issues. So I had to kind of make a, a balance uh, of on the one hand um, uh, designer objects that I wanted to show, but on the other hand also uh, designers I invited to deal with this history and to deal with the location. So I invited uh, two graphic designers, um, uh, Nikki Ponte uh, and uh, Nikki Bergmans, um, who created a, a series of flags based on the uh, uh, typology uh, that they found in the, in the houses, um, in the facades, in the, in the patterns. And uh, with those flags they invited the people living in those houses to tell the story of um, the, the city during the dictatorship, uh, which resulted in many uh, different type of stories, which we uh, recorded uh, in various interviews. There were people, uh, this guy was a military at the time, there were people from the resistance uh, who, uh, who we spoke to, all now living in peace, but all sharing a, a very interesting and, and uh, very kind of crucial history for, for the town and for the whole country. So uh, I think this is a uh, Quite a strong project, and um, I will I'll send a link to uh, to the whole video that we made. Another intervention we did was walk around in with uh, these letters that uh, that we did. Respeto means respect, ser means to be, uh, memoria means to remember, and amor means uh, love. So this was uh, quite quite a pro project uh, in 2015 that we did uh, that I wanted to show you. Uh, this also continued uh, to several locations. Um, in, uh, in Brazil, this in Sao Paulo, uh, where it was just more kind of showing the works. Um, and I was so tired at a certain moment when I traveled to Rio that I decided to do something different. I decided to invite students and curators from Rio and just give them the objects. And I was very curious to see what type of exhibition they would come up with. And the interesting thing is, was when you give a series of objects to different curators or students, that they of course make a completely different exhibition than how I would do that. And I, for me, this was very interesting to see uh, how they interpret uh, all these different objects. So this is what they came up with. Um, now broadening up the, the scope and finding true exchange, I really got fascinated with the idea of, um, of exchange between artists, between architects, between designers. And I decided to elaborate this more during the Olympics in 2016, where I was asked to uh, do the cultural program. Um, and we decided to do a big cultural program uh, called Obra, which means works in Portuguese. Um, here you see uh, a, a shot of the manifestation. And what we decided to do to make uh, duos, uh, 10 duos, um, one Dutch designer with a, a Brazilian designer, uh, bringing them together and having them create a work of one a Dutch architect with a Brazilian architect, one theater maker, one writer, and one musician. So a very multidisciplinary work. And we invited them to, uh, to create a work together um, in one month. So um, here you see some of the shots. 
I'm going to try to see if this video works. My name is Clara. I'm a Brazilian designer working with beauty. Together we're building an oracle. We created a form to collect the answers about the future of Brazil. We have collected over 100 answers that we asked you, the people of Brazil, online. Um, and from this collection... With me, the video is not working. I'm not too sure if it works with you guys. So I'll skip through this. Um, so it was really this partnership between um, uh, different uh, artists. And I think this, uh, this was really a, a way to approach, let's say, international cooperation and not having international artists go somewhere to, uh, to show of the work and going back. So it's really trying to get a meaningful exchange uh, between uh, two countries, two cultures, uh, uh, two different type of artists uh, in this sense. Musicians, I'm gonna not show the whole video. Um, so over to some smaller projects. So I think probably now it looks like I only do this kind of large scale uh, Olympic Games uh, Biennale type of works, but I love working on a much smaller scale because it gives a lot more flexibility to deal with uh, just one idea or with a fascination. Uh, usually it involves very little money or uh, no money at all. And this is a project that I wanted to show in, I think, 2017 I did around the work of an Italian designer group called Super Studio that you might know. And I was fascinated with uh, some of the quotes that they said, uh, if design is merely an inducement to consume, then we must reject design. And if architecture is merely the codifying of the bourgeois model of ownership and society, then we must reject architecture. We can live without architecture. And I thought these notions were so strong and also a little bit strange as a designer or as an architect to be so critical of your own profession to kind of reject it. Uh, that I thought it would be interesting to showcase it and to have architects reflect on it. Um, so in 2017, uh, I was asked to do an exhibition at the Design Fair in Sao Paulo, and uh, I proposed this and they liked this. Um, Super Studio then did not build much, but they did create a lot of uh, collages um, that you see here. So I wanted to showcase these uh, collages, but to make a, a modern day interpretation of it. So I invited Brazilian designers to uh, kind of with this in mind to uh, design these collages uh, um, uh, with the, the Brazilian reality uh, of that time. So just showing you that. And we decided to showcase this in a space which uh, we wanted to kind of model on the endless grid that Super Studio um, uh, came up with. So just a series of tiles and a series of mirrors. Uh, and uh, the collages we, um, we started showing in the very small uh, piccolos uh, for visitors uh, to to gaze in, uh, and we started using it as well as a as a space for talks. So just a small project. Another one again at the design fair, uh, which was uh, I was interested to look at food design, and if you could consider uh, cake in this sense also um, a design. And for me, the most important thing here was to uh, bring the stories around uh, a cake which every Brazilian loves. Uh, um, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, whether you're middle class, everybody loves a corn cake, a bolo de fubá, uh, and everybody has a story with a corn cake. So I, I decided to invite different type of uh, designers uh, to make their best corn cake, but mostly to share the stories around the, the corn cake. So this was very kind of odd for a design fair to showcase this, but I really wanted to bring a, a different notion uh, to the fair and not only show kind of high-end design products, but um, to show, um, show that this, in my opinion, is also design. So I had to say some words about cakes. And of course, the great thing about the project was that we ended up uh, eating everything at the end. So uh, another small one, uh, an exhibition about, uh, uh, about bicycles. Uh, just a wall with a bike showing a Dutch bike culture uh, in all its uh, facets and... Um, people to explore different uh, notions of, of bike culture in, um, in the Netherlands. Now, I think the, the smallest project I ever did uh, with really zero work was at the International Arctic Green of Sao Paulo in 2015. We had no budget at all, just uh, we could buy just some tape and make this art installation uh, in this space. Just I want to show this uh, to show that with zero money, you can uh, do a lot, I think. Uh, I'm still very proud of this, uh, this work we did. Um, getting the message across on sustainability, of course, you have to, as an uh, exhibition maker, as a curator, you have to deal a lot with, um, with your subject as well. And uh, I try to really get close to the subject and really try to uh, 
push uh, a subject across. Um, I believe very much that we should spread uh, uh, the notion of sustainability um, in design, through design, and I'd like to uh, kind of um, get related uh, more and more to that. Uh, this is a project I came across which I thought was very strong, which I really wanted to exhibit. Um, uh, this is a designer, Nika Hoogvliet, who studied the bones of organic chicken and the bones of industrial chicken in relation to uh, uh, ceramics. Um, so part of uh, China porcelain uh, is made out of chicken bones. And she was curious to see if the, uh, the China porcelain um, of uh, industrial chicken is of uh, poorer quality than that of uh, biological chicken. I uh, hope I'm explaining it well. So she did uh, many studies and tests uh, of it. And we decided to show that during the Beijing Design Week in 2018. Small exhibition again, just some of the works. Uh, we tried to show <coughs> how industrial chicken uh, are living and how their bone structure works and how biological chicken works. Very kind of simple approach. Um, I think many Chinese students really, really liked it. And you could really tell that, um, of course, the bone structure of uh, that of a biological chicken is um, is much stronger. They have a lot more space to walk around to, to have their bones grow. And therefore, the porcelain is also much stronger. Now, another artist I work with a lot who deals with the same subject is Claudia Jongstra, textile artist. Uh, she is internationally known a little bit. She makes huge murals. Uh, from the plants uh, of her own garden and uh, with the wool from the sheep of her own garden. Um, and she invited me in 2016 to make an exhibition of uh, a retrospective of her work. And what I found fascinating to showcase the whole process that she works with. So from the plants, from the painting of the, of the uh, linen uh, to how she gets to her textiles. Uh, and actually the, the process of making it as well, I find quite fascinating. So we want to showcase that inside the museum. So this was a continuing artwork inside the museum. Here's the artist herself. Um, we did a three day interview with her um, about her thoughts and ideas behind it, which we showcased in the main space, which became kind of a space to get together, to have meetings, to have talks. This was at the opening. So always trying to create a place where people can get together to discuss uh, ideas and, um, and all that. This was at the opening. Another one I did for her was a project Back to Black in which um, she studied um, the color black in the 17th century and how that was translated in, in um, 17th century uh, Flemish paintings uh, and how she would respond to her painting of black uh, on that. Again, small exhibition, nice to deal with also in, uh, in a spatial way. Last project of her that I did uh, was in 2020, Inner Vitality for Museum uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we were asked to do a garden and to make a connection between the garden and an exhibition inside. Here again, the artist, we decided this time to work a lot with paper uh, and to have the expression of the vitality of the plants, the inner vitality of plants on the paper. Um, so here you see two huge circles uh, where you see uh, different type of vitality of plants, some biological plants, some uh, more uh, industrial plants in a sense. Uh, and inside a huge uh, work she uh, created, kind of again creating a space uh, which is uh, kind of an intimate space. So those uh, were some portfolio projects uh, I wanted to show. I hope I'm still okay on time. Um, and for the, um, for the second part of this lecture, I wanted to explore more the past uh, and where I find uh, inspiration. Um, and I wanted to dive deeper into uh, the work of a Dutch architect called Aldo van Eyck. Um, he passed away already some time ago. Maybe some of you uh, know his work. Um, and uh, I think for me is quite an inspiration um, because he did quite a lot of exhibitions as well, which is not that well known. He did very few buildings, uh, 17 buildings in his whole life, uh, and he did 21 exhibitions together with his wife, Honey, quite different exhibitions, but he had quite clear ideas of what an exhibition, an art exhibition or architecture exhibition should be. And I think uh, this for me is, is very much um, an inspiration. Um, so with uh, this part of the lecture, I'd like to uh, really kind of focus on what does the role of, uh, where does the role of the designer end and where does the role of the curator start? Um, for me, that's very interesting as well, because 
more and more I get involved with the designer part of an exhibition, even though I'm not a designer myself, but I, I keep developing more and more clear ideas on how to translate a story, how to translate an idea, um, which I think is mostly uh, the, the ideas is part of the work of the curator. And normally a curator kind of gives this idea to the designer and the designer then makes something beautiful out of it. But I think these roles, at least in my practice, are changing constantly. Um, so I more and more see myself as a designer curator and not so much as just a curator. And I think that is already very strongly clear in the work of Aldo van Eyck. The other thing I wanted to, uh, to emphasize here, because um, you are, of course, all architecture students, what is the role between his build work and his exhibitions? So to sketch a little bit the context of uh, the beginning of all this work was uh, just after World War II. The Netherlands and Amsterdam in particular were in complete ruins. And there were a lot of children uh, growing up because there was a huge baby boom. And Aldo himself uh, had children as well around that same time. So the, the start of his work, the first 10, 15 years, was very much involved uh, with children, with play and the importance of that in a city. Um, and Aldo wrote quite a lot about that, and he always used the, the, the metaphor uh, when snow uh, hits the town um, and how different the city becomes and how different people uh, interacting with the city become. This is something he, he wrote. Look, snow, a miraculous trick of the skies, a fleeting correction. All at once the child is the lord of the city, but the joy of paralyzed vehicles is short-lived. He really urged architects to provide something for the human child, more permanent than just snow, if perhaps less abundant. Another miracle. This is what he wrote in a, in a book he published around the same time, The Child, the City and the Artist. Um, this was one of the first commissions he was asked to, to do. Uh, he had very little work and the municipality invited him to, uh, to design uh, large scale housing um, in, in, the, um, in the periphery of uh, Amsterdam. But he quit after the first day. Uh, he hated this job. He, he felt it lacked any type of um, uh, creativity, originality. It was just kind of automated work. So he quit after the first day. Uh, his boss uh, did, however, convince him to stay, but gave him a different type of project, which fitted much more with the ideas of uh, Van Eyck, which was um, a series of playgrounds that he was asked to, um, to design. Now, Amsterdam at this time, like I said, was still very much in rumbles. There were many vacant spots um, and many, uh, many children uh, because of the baby boom. So the municipality decided to kind of um, temporarily uh, put a lot of playgrounds in these spots. And this was the kind of the perfect place for Aldo to, uh, to experiment with different types of forms, geometric forms with uh, this notion of play, and uh, not only for children, but also for, for elderly or the connection between elderly and children on these uh, playgrounds. Uh, this was in, in still in the old town, but in the in the newer parts, he decided to do the same, kind of revitalize or give energy to a neighborhood. On the left, you see uh, before, and on the right, you see uh, what is a simple uh, intervention of a sandbox and some uh, climbing uh, racks uh, can do, and how to vitalize this. He also designed all the, the elements itself. Very important for Van Eyck here was um, to have all solid elements. He believed that the children should move and run between the elements and that the elements itself should not move. So there's never a swing or any of these, um, these kind of instruments. Um, and another thing that uh, Van Eyck believed very much in was that uh, all the objects should be very abstract because children should project their imagination on it. So for a child, this can be an igloo or this can be a castle or this can be a house. Um, and it really stimulates their, uh, their fantasy, which for Van Eyck was very important to, uh, let's say, to train creative uh, citizens from a very early age on. And the last thing I think which was quite revolutionary, at the time already considered that uh, playgrounds and all the instruments in it should be gender neutral. It could be similar for uh, boys as for girls. And this was 47, so uh, some, uh, what is it, 70 years ago. Um, he did some more uh, work um, in uh, dealing with children. This is a school he did in Nagelen. Uh, but I think his most famous work, which is considered his masterpiece, which is uh, the orphanage, also deals very much with, um, with children and with play. Um, at the time, he was very much inspired by some travels he did especially to Africa, to, uh, to Mali, to the Dogon culture he studied, and to the Pueblos in, in New Mexico. And he found specific forms there that he, he thought were almost like um, 
primal in uh, in human mankind and he said these type of forms really inspire me and should be translated into the buildings into the design work uh, that i'm doing um and so for him a house in cameroon he once wrote has more aesthetic dignity than most of our prefabricated houses the ones that he started working on on day one and and, and quit his job um, and another thing he really found in in this um, in this culture was what he called the twin phenomenon. And the twin phenomenon in in Van Eyck's theories is is two elements that are seemingly uh, counter opposing. So, for instance, a square and a circle, but really fit together. So Van Eyck is always very kind of um, uh, these two elements that are opposing each other. They form one and make something bigger than just one and one. Um, here you see again a, a reference to uh, the playgrounds and the kind of very simple forms that he used. This is the ground plan. And what I think is quite interesting is how it, uh, the parallels it shows with ground plans of, uh, of the Dogon structure. This is a, a ground plan from a, um, a work he saw in Mali. Uh, here again, his own work. And if you see, for instance, here in red, um, a small little... Um, little place for rest again the, the square and um, and the circle uh, you find it uh, here in the in the um, ground plants of, uh, of the Dogon as well here you see a picture he used a lot in lectures again uh, um, a square shaped and a circle um, here a picture he um, he took again in Africa and here you see the the roof of the orphanage of all these cupolas uh, that uh, he created and for Van Eyck, this was another quote he used a lot, a house is like a small city, a city is like a big house. So this orphanage should feel uh, like a city for children. It's, it's inside and it's outside. Um, and that, I think, um, is, should be expressed very much in how he related to the threshold and especially to the door. He had a kind of fascination with that. Uh, what is a door, he wrote. It's a flat surface with hinges and a lock. Cons cons constituting a hard, terrifying borderline. Just think of it. A rectangle two inches thick and six feet high. What a hair-raising poverty. A guillotine is kinder. So he hated that. And is that the reality of a door? Well, perhaps the greater reality of a door is a localized setting for a wonderful human gesture, conscious entry and departure. That's what a door is. Something that frames your coming and going, a vital experience not only for those that do so, but also for those encountered or left behind. So this was a, a door he, he studied in Africa, <clears throat> which has this kind of um, a very slow notion of entering and leaving, not a very harsh uh, break. <clears throat> and this is the door of the orphanage seen from the inside. So it's more like a, a gateway. Here you see the, the courtyard, and here you see the courtyard of the, um, of the, the projects he studied in Africa. Here a photo of the, of the courtyard. And this kind of then moves uh, slowly to the interior. Here again, many kind of uh, geometrical forms for children to play with. Uh, and about the inside, he wrote, the walls of the inner street are similar to outside walls, rough, brown, and powerful, like a coconut on the outside. The rooms adjacent to the inner street are white, smooth, and soft, like the milky inside of a coconut. And here you see an image of, uh, of the inside. Now, how did Van Eyck translate uh, these ideas into an exhibition? Um, I'd like to show a few uh, that I think really showcase this work. This is uh, an art group he belonged to. All the way to the right, you see, um, you see uh, Aldo. Um, and the art group was called Cobra, consisted of um, artists from Copenhagen, from Brussels and Amsterdam, making what some would call naive art, very much inspired by, uh, by children's drawings. So again, there's the notion of the child there. Here you see Aldo at, at work in the museum, um, um, kind of deciding where the, the painting should go. He often put them just on the ground uh, or put a sculpture next to it. Next to it. Um, and this is <clears throat> kind of how he approached it. I laid them under a glass on low pal pallets. After all, in this sort of work, top and bottom have a different, more relative significance than in the work conceived and created vertically. For the poets uh, that were also part of the art group, he made this kind of almost like J-like uh, uh, slat structure. Um, and for the opening, all the poets uh, went uh, inside. Uh, rooms with all the paintings at eye level or with the upper edges on the same line form an incorrect horizon, he believed. It only involves the viewer and not the nature or the size of the paintings, nor the nature and proportions of the room itself. 
all those backs and noses bending forward almost against the canvas, it's an odd sight. So again, you really try to find kind of the creativity and um, yeah, breaking away from, um, from what was considered um, a normal in that sense. Here's an architecture exhibition he did in 1951, uh, where you already see how he integrated uh, paintings, in this case, a Mondrian, and also furniture, and the furniture just attached to the wall. So really trying to break away from the traditional notion of an architecture exhibition. Here with this project with, that he did for the, for the Museum of Modern Art, Men's and House, Man and Home, you see how much um, the, the role of the curator and designer kind of um, uh, conflict with each other or coincide. Um, this was an exhibition about uh, uh, furniture in a house. And the curator at the time was, uh, had a very didactic approach uh, in which he would tell the audience uh, not to buy specific lampshades of a specific color and not to buy specific chairs and not, not, don't do this, don't do that. Um, and Aldo really hated it, and, um, but he still needed the, the job um, uh, to, to get an income. So he demanded to have one extra room with, uh, the ex with the exhibition, in which he kind of made his own statement, a very artistic kind of piece that you see here. Uh, and he put um, uh, a quote there as well as a reflection on the exhibition itself. So everyone should have his own bad taste which uh, the people who hired him did not like at all. He was forced to, uh, to take it out. So he changed it to, um, to a poem he decided to put there. So here you see that the role of designer and curator is very much mixed with, uh, with Van Eyck. Um, here another exhibition that I wanted to show um, of the artist uh, Shikinchi Tajiri uh, sculpture in which you see uh, that, um, that Van Eyck struggled a lot or, or was kind of working very much on different forms, again, very much the circle. Um, this is the final layout. And this is what it looked like, just paper sheets hanging from, uh, hanging from the, the ceiling uh, to kind of uh, make a very intimate space for the, um, for the sculptural work. And here you see the, um, the tearing down of the exhibition at the very end and a kind of joyful and playful experience uh, that was as well. Um, here you see again how much um, uh, Van Eyck was dealing with the notion of the circle, uh, not only in the exhibitions, but actually during this period of his, time, of his life uh, in all the works he was doing. So this was an extension of a house he did. The rectangular space was the, the original house and he uh, added it with, uh, with the circle. This was a, a design competition for a church, the Wheels of Heaven, <clears throat> again, four circles, and this is what it looked like. It won the competition, but never was realized. Um, and you also see it in the work that I'd like to end my presentation with, which is a, a pavilion, a temporary pavilion he did for uh, the Sonsbeek uh, Sculpture uh, uh, Biennale in 1966. Central to my idea was that the structure should not reveal what happens inside until one gets quite close, approaching it from the ends. Seen from the sides, it appears closed and massive, guarding secrets. Here you can see it again. It's kind of like a, a big block. You see some sculpture, but you're kind of curious um, or your curiosity is aroused to, to find out what is inside. If we look at the ground plan again, we see a square with a circle, but <clears throat> you see it's quite open, um, but not a very functional approach. Um, it's not like a museum type of setting. Um, and it's almost like a labyrinthian approach. And again, this was something that Van Eyck dealt with. He called this uh, labyrinthian clarity. So again, this twin phenomenon, two almost opposing uh, elements, a labyrinth and clarity, make creating one. Here you see the, the design sketch he did with very kind of uh, personal uh, comments uh, about the various uh, scup sculptures um, that he programmed himself as well. So, for instance, he writes, boom, oh, sorry, he ended up uh, walking into a sculpture by Shikinchi, or, ah, Brancusi, or Giacometti, too tall for once. <clears throat> so it's a very personal approach he took um, to this design uh, uh, project. Here we see the model, and here we see how it ended uh, up looking like. Again, there's a very much this idea of, of play uh, as a playground for children and for adults. Here we see the, the final structure in 66. Um, just some images of the works. Uh, it was torn down 
<coughs> because it was temporarily pavilion. Uh, but in history, it became such a kind of a big thing, uh, and everybody uh, kept uh, referring to it that in 2006 the museum decided to uh, rebuild it, and um, that's uh, the project I wanted to end with. To conclude, I, I would like to say that uh, what I am fascinated by and what I studied is that uh, the Van Eyck's were really kind of architects uh, who are almost like artists with architectural tools, which they really articulated through their own exhibitions as well. And exhibitions were part of ongoing experiments into forms, into proportions, colors, programming, and therefore they form an inextricable part of the overall oeuvre of the Van Eyck's. And as, as such, there is no hierarchy or hier hierarchical relationship between the build works and the exhibitions. And this is something that I'd like to conclude to and also uh, to kind of hope if the next time you go to a museum and you see in an exhibition, um, please uh, look at the structure, look at the design and how a message is kind of uh, being uh, put forth and how to, uh, to get that across. And I hope very much that uh, if you're later becoming architects that you uh, maybe do some, um, uh, some, uh, some exhibition work as well and really try to approach it as, uh, as a building as well, just as the Van Eyck's did. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm very curious to hear if there are any questions. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. That was a great presentation. We've had several questions already uh, coming in through the chat. So let me just begin with the first one. Um, Karina would like to thank you for your presentation. Uh, she found it very interesting, especially uh, seeing so many diverse exhibitions. Uh, what she would like to know is, uh, when you're talking about sustainability, uh, could you maybe throw some light on the ways to deal with these exhibitions after their time duration has completed with respect to the disposal procedure? How do you attempt to reuse the material or dispose them in a non-hazardous way? Yes, I think a very good question. and, and um something you have to deal with, especially because, for instance, I now work at the Design Week, which is only nine days. And if you see the type of material we use uh, and after nine days throw away, um, it's, it's really <clears throat> not very, um, uh, it's just simply not good. Uh, while on the other hand, we really try to promote um, uh, a message about sustainability. So this is something we're looking uh, more and more forward to. We set up a network between the different museums in, in the Netherlands to see if uh, once an exhibition is finished, that all the material will be put in uh, in a storage and that for next exhibitions, whether it's a different museum or where, whether it's a design week, people can use that material again. So we're really quite aware of it, but I think it's, it can still be improved a lot. But uh, I think it's a very good question. Uh, the next question is from Rohan and uh, he was wondering how, uh, if at all, your training as a filmmaker <coughs> has affected your curatorial work. And uh, when and how can we watch your film on Max? Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that question, Rowan. I think very much um, it really uh, affected my work as a curator. I, I studied cinema, like I said, but in particular I studied uh, screenwriting, which is very much on how you tell a story, uh, when do you deliver information. And I think this is something you do in an exhibition as well. In the beginning I was not aware of that at all, uh, but I started more and more noticing that, like, okay, when does a visitor come in? When does he enter an exhibition? And what type of information do you give there? And how, how do you build up attention uh, in this? And um, yeah, I think my, my training as a, as a screenwriter really helped in that. Um, like uh, the introduction, and uh, as uh, Rowan mentioned as well, that um, after 20 years of not working on cinema, after I finished the cinema, I, I now started um, uh, this uh, exhibition, uh, sorry, this, uh, oh, this documentary okay. in 2016 on Max. And I just finished it, um, so uh, we're really ready to show it. Uh, during Because of the lockdown here, all the cinemas are closed, uh, but we're kind of ready to, to show it uh, as soon as the cinemas open. And I'm very, very uh, happy to, uh, to bring it at some point to India as well, because one of the, the chapters in the documentary is, um, is about the building of Le Corbusier in, in Ahmedabad. So we did some good filming in, uh, in India as well, so I think it relates to India strongly as well. So uh, as soon as possible, I hope to, uh, to get over to, to India and to show it. Sarah, would you take over? Yeah. Sarah. Yeah, it seems Sanaya's connection is uh, 
Sara, do you want to take the next question? Sure, I can do that. Uh, the next, the next question is from Ankush. Uh, so he says, uh, "Thanks, Yon, for the wonderful presentation. That's a very interesting mode of practice you have articulated in the presentation. What Thank are your you. thoughts on the changes that this mode of practice brings to the creative process itself?" Since the pitch is to a much larger clientele than a typical architect client pitch, is there also a degree of freedom that comes from the lack of patronage or allegiance to a single client? Yes, I think so. And, and I, I think also that is one of the reasons why I think the Van Eyck's really like to work in, um, in museums because they have this much bigger freedom. Of course, with, uh, with uh, the... Um, and the the request of let's say um, uh, uh, designing a building, I think the brief is much more strict because you have to deal with with a much much larger budget, uh, with many different types of regulations, with uh, how a building functions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think uh, working in a museum, of course, uh, or working for a biennale gives a much larger space, and I think um, therefore you can also sometimes see it as a testing ground. But the other thing I would be afraid of that. Um, exhibitions will then only be seen as, let's say, this testing ground for buildings. Uh, and I think they should be judged uh, on the merit of their own strength, uh, which is uh, exhibition making and uh, which is very strong as well. But I do think uh, that uh, the, these clients give much larger freedom than, uh, let's say, uh, traditional clients in architecture. I hope that answers the questions. Yes, yes, it did. Thank you. Sanaya, taking over. <coughs> Yes, sorry, uh, network issues. Uh, no all right, uh, the next question is, uh, do you see your practice as an academic endeavor? And if yes, how do you bring such methods in architecture or design? Uh, in continuation, how do you break conventional pedagogic approaches? Good question. I, I think I've never seen my, um, my work as uh, academic work. Um, up until recently when I started doing my PhD and started to get much more involved in ideas, theoretical ideas about uh, exhibition uh, uh, making and kind of relate that back to my practice. Uh, and what was the second part of the, the question again? The pedagogical uh, how approach. do you break the conventional pedagogic approaches? Um, <clears throat> I think what I like very much of, uh, of an exhibition that is one way of teaching as well. You have a school which has a, uh, a specific format of teaching and uh, format of uh, pedagogy, but an exhibition can do the same and is not specifically catered to just students or, or just children. It's catered to a large uh, uh, audience. And therefore, I always try to make my, uh, my exhibitions some way um, uh, accessible to a large crowd, even if it's dealing with um, difficult notions or more complex notions, for instance, of the super studio uh, work, which I think is, is quite radical in their thinking. But how do you translate then these kind of uh, radical notions into a, an exhibition which can cater to a lot of people? Um, and I think in that sense, uh, we really tried. And even if it's something simple as, for instance, the cake exhibition I showed, you try to bring that to a different level than just showing some nice design of a cake. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's a pedagogical uh, a model, but in a kind of very broad and kind of flexible way. Okay, the next one is more like a comment. Uh, your lecture throws light on something that we as architects and patrons of architecture forget to acknowledge, that architecture should be able to make room for continuous curation, meeting the requirements and aspirations of the inhabitants. The architect is a curator and vice versa. Your comments? Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Yeah, um, it's strongly, uh, strongly agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. One last question. Um, have you tried curating any exhibitions digitally in the pandemic or any other time? And what are the challenges and opportunities do this specific format offer? Yeah, very good question. Um, I started working for the Dutch Design Week uh, last year. Um, and uh, the design week is always in October, so the pandemic broke out in, in March, uh, and we were kind of hoping to have a, a physical design week because we thought, ah, the pandemic will probably be finished in, in October of last year. Of course, we were completely wrong. So during the year, we really had to, um, to think of different models, and of course, a, a digital model. 
And um, I must say that I'm uh, struggling quite a lot with it. We, uh, we made these virtual rooms uh, and we invited many designers to deal with it. But what I think I realized that it is uh, a complete new instrument and a complete new way of, um, of, of, of getting your information across. And I think it's not uh, particularly bad. It's a very interesting new way, but it has its own rules and its own ways that we still have to explore uh, uh, very much. I'm very happy, of course, with the possibility uh, as me giving a presentation now from my uh, living room here in Amsterdam in India, which I think is, is a great way uh, that we can use the digital format. But for exhibition making, um, I think we still have a lot of uh, ground to cover. Um, and we keep continue at the Design Week with uh, these experiments. Um, but um, yeah, I, I myself, I still haven't really found uh, good ways to do so. I'm also a very analog guy, so uh, maybe uh, that's my problem. All right. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, I think it was a very interesting presentation and it was great interacting with you. Thank you. Sarah, Thank you so much. over to you. Thank you, Sanaya. Thank you, Jan. We shall now begin with the first session of today's round of thesis presentations. Uh, even as all of you are well versed with the rules, especially the participants, uh, please let this serve as a reminder to you that, uh, especially the ones who will be presenting, that each presentation is for 10 minutes only. An auditory signal will serve as a cue at the eighth minute that you have two minutes more remaining to conclude your presentation. After each presentation, 20 minutes have been allotted to our panelists for their comments and suggestions. Uh, we shall now begin with Rohit Kudale's thesis presentation on idol making for Ganpati Utsav in Mumbai. Uh, his thesis code number is A06. Rohit, you may begin. Yes. Can see the screen. Yes. Uh, idol making for Ganpati Utsav in Mumbai. So the thesis uses idol making practices as a lens to understand the process of setting up of Ganesh Utsav in Mumbai, and with an intent to architecturally intervene into the structure of the system that leads to the uh, eco-friendly festival. The city and the festival. Over 14,000 mandals in the city set up the uh, set up Mumbai into a 10 days festival every year during Ganesh Utsav. The 10 days festival is set up over a time period of 120 days. Uh, the timeline shows the processes that go uh, in, the, in those 120 days uh, to set up the 10 days festival, idol making being the major part of it. According to 2018 data, uh, more than 13,000 mandals uh, immerse their idol into natural water bodies. If you calculate the space required to build those idols, uh, uh, space equals to nine football fields in Mumbai uh, is used for four months for making these idols every year. The city and the workshops. Uh, so these workshops are mostly located uh, in the stretch between Paral and Chinspokuri uh, in the center of the city uh, from where these idols are dispersed into the city and the suburbs. Uh, the map on the right shows the places uh, where these idols are immersed at the end of the festival. Uh, so going to that stretch and mapping out the work workshops, uh, one can understand uh, the scale of work and the amount of idols they produce uh, and the amount of workforce that goes behind it. Uh, uh, so selecting one idol, uh, idol making workshop uh, for detailing out study, the workshop, uh, so the drawing maps the uh, setup of the workshop. It look, looks at the ground conditions. Uh, the muddy grounds uh, are always reclaimed with debris in order to uh, make proper uh, grounds for the work to happen. Uh, it also looks into materials that are used and the process of erecting the idols. Uh, the drawing also maps the spatial hierarchy and the living and working conditions in the workshop. Uh, most of the workforce 
the skilled artis- artisans come from uh, the konkan belt uh, they sow the paddy fields uh, in the monsoon they come to work in mumbai in these workshops for four months and they return by the time of the harvest uh, so government identifies the structure where the the the, uh, the idols are worshipped for the 10 days festival but uh, there is a no legal procedure to identify the setup of workshops uh, that are used for making these idols uh, so a cost of almost 3 crores is spent uh, on this temporary stru- on this temporary structure uh, every year for the four months so high investment in the structure less time is leading to labor oriented process and use of quick material that is leading to environmental losses at the end of the festival uh, in order to replace the material with an eco friendly material uh, we need more skill hands more time and better working conditions the city fabric has changed over the years and uh, so as the uh, festival has also grown uh, the 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 uh, the idol making that used to happen between the share shared spaces in the chawl has now now moved to huge sets in the open grounds uh, the the idol itself has moved from the model of worship to a model of identity in the city uh, by mapping out the procession routes one can understand that uh, the the uh, the flyover plays a very important role in locating these workshops so the first image shows uh, the event that happens when a idol is coming out of the workshop then uh, the whole traffic is taken up by the flyover and the space below that flyover is used uh, by the public for pro- processions and showing of the idols uh, so uh, the railway owns huge parcel of land in the city center uh, along the tracks that is rented out for various activities over the year in order to generate revenue uh, most of these workshops are located on the railway plat uh, railway plots the chosen chosen site uh, is a part of a huge railway complex with the sports facilities and car sheds uh, the 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 ground itself uh, yeah the then uh, the ground uh, the chosen site uh, has a road a main road on one side and a avenue of huge rain trees uh, adjacent to a inner road and is surrounded by the railway complex on all the sides Uh, the ground itself is rented for various events throughout the year uh, wherein large amounts are spent on erecting these temporary structures for the events and minimal rent is generated by the uh, railway uh, so the proposed intervention is a event space for the city which will be majorly used in setting up of ganesh utsav in mumbai uh, it is set up on railway lands such that the railway can also generate income by renting out the space and thus creating a public private Uh, interrelation for the open spaces in the city so the building is imagined uh, through a series of diagrams concept diagrams uh, taking the plot giving the necessary offsets uh, pulling up the maximum buildable area and carving out a event ground of, out of it is the formal idea uh, then the edge conditions of the ground actually dictates the uh, the the function of the building so the one on the uh, on 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 the inner road becomes a public edge and a public pavilion and when on the compound wall becomes a service building and a and has a service edge to it and in between is the event space that is it uh, so uh, so uh, considering uh, considering the, uh, the the routes in the city uh, from where the idols are taken uh, the scale of the idols is decided uh, accordingly the mandals have come up with some standard sizes of the trolleys on which these idols are made uh, so using this structural sizes and laying them on the ground one can get the grid structural grid of the building that uh, i am imagining uh, then uh, in a sectional idea uh, it is a series of uh, stanchions which are grouted using a, a, a which are held together uh, using a grouted cable which wraps around them removing the uh, the unnecessary columns from the ground adding uh, uh, bracings for structural stability adding the built mass uh, clearing up the ground space for activities adding a tensile roof uh, a foldable fabric roof on it uh, and then shaping the roof for the monsoons because the major workshop thing uh, workshop is set up in the monsoon season uh, so programmatically uh, 
the building is further divided uh, into a, a, a public pavilion event ground and a service building which is further divided as a storage space and a public pavilion and the service building is divided into a admin block and a service building necessary water requirements and uh, toilet facilities are given uh, then the 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 ground floor of the service building has workshops and storage spaces that is open up into the ground for the workshop to happen uh, it has dormitories for handicap common kitchens and canteens and the upper floor are used as dormitory dormitories and the south facade is kept as a circulation bar the front part becomes the admin uh, block uh, if you look at the plan of the building the plan uh, has a service edge a service building then an event ground a public pavilion and a public edge uh, looking at the service building the service building has a uh, workshop that opens into the ground it has common kitchens uh, then these storage spaces are provided such that it facilitates the uh, material requirement that is happening uh, that is there for the idol making process and there are cutoff lobbies for the uh, dormitories and uh, waiting areas uh, for the admin <clears throat> the upper floors are uh, are majorly dormitories uh, which have bunk beds uh, so the cross section through the building you can see uh, the, the 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 service building the ground which is having a a foldable roof on top where the idol making activity is happening and the public pavilion with a, a fabric facade that can open up into the ground when the upper roof is not there Uh, a, a long section through the uh, public, uh, the the service building. Uh, it is uh, majorly divided into workshop spaces, uh, the dormitories, and uh, some common kitchens and waiting areas. Uh, a section through the shed, looking at the uh, service building. So the service building, this facade of the service building is actually facing south. So it has uh, louvers, uh, metal louvers that cut off the sun. and then the lower this part is the workshop and uh, storage spaces are provided that opens up into the ground uh, a, 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 a section through the uh, shed looking at the service build, uh, at the pavilion uh, so the pavilion actually has these uh, fabric facades that can open up uh, when the upper shed is not there when the upper shed is folded up and then uh, the 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 opening actually opens up the pavilion into the ground it extends the space uh, then uh, the pavilion has a public toilet and a storage uh, that is required to store all the bamboos on all on the ground uh, so section through the pavilion so the pavilion has a transparent facade on the north side which is looking into the on the south side which is looking into the uh, trees uh, it has these display mounts which can be used uh to exhibit things uh to exhibit panels to uh, as mm-hmm. markers for mm-hmm. stalls etc yes yes your 10 minutes are up yeah. okay yeah. Uh, try to uh, conclude it thank you building is imagined through uh four wall sections these are the details of the opening facade and the wall sections that are looking into the ground uh Uh, these are some of the detailed drawings of the uh, of the uh, facades and the edge conditions uh, the wall sections uh, this is a detail of uh, the mechanism that opens up the roof uh, opens up the facade of the pavilion uh, these are some details uh, for the roof for the facade uh, so the building uh, the, the ground is actually serviced for electricity Uh, such that each bay gets electrical supply for the workshop and same for water <coughs> has okay. fire fighting on the edges yes 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 i am just wrapping up so okay. this is what i imagine the space to be uh, the pavilion to be when the roof is not there it acts as a maidan and uh, when the roof is there uh, it acts as a event space where uh, the whole city gathers i end my presentation with a, a visual of what was the existing uh, workshop like and what my proposed uh, workshop would like me thank you thank you rohit uh i would now request shomitro 
Anu Anuradha and uh, Yon to give in their comments. Do you want to start? Or? Yeah, please. You want me to start? Yeah, you. Rohit, thank you so much for your presentation. I think uh, it was very interesting uh, and very uh, well detailed project. It reminded me of this um, Kumbhmela project, which uh, I think I'm sure it's uh, an inspiration for this project as well. Um, I liked the, the notion of temporality of a festival and how to make a, a permanent structure that deals with that. Uh, I think that was very strong. My only question was actually, I, I didn't really get the, the materiality uh, you had in mind. Is it just steel or, or what was the materiality that, uh, that the construction is made of? So the buildings will have, will be, the former will be in steel and the ground will be covered with a fabric roof on top, which folds up when the maidan is required as an open space. And fabric in this sense is what type of fabric have you thought about? Uh, it, it is a tensile roofing fabric. Okay. Like a folder. That was my only question. Uh, but thank you so much. Great project. Thank you. Rohit, thank you for that lovely presentation. I think it was it was really interesting, very detailed, I mean very easy to read and, and it's a really good project as well. Um, I was wondering, did you get the chance to test some of those mechanisms through um, uh, making sort of physical prototypes, even though that must have been really hard during this pandemic academic semester? Yeah, so I had made some models for the facades uh, that open up and the just before, before executing them, it, I was working with models only. Uh, yeah, I was just interesting uh, if you were working sort of across media and if that assisted your thinking. Hmm. And well, was it helpful? I mean, you know, because what you've presented is basically graphic presentation, and just I was just wondering if there was a, a backstory to, um, you know, what you were presenting today as well. Yeah. So, uh, so majorly, the building took place using the models of, because uh, the mechanisms fell into place, and then I detailed out uh, how to place them in the building built form. Right. Okay. Right. So yeah, that was the process. Yeah, that's, that's what I was wondering, Rohit, because that's what we didn't see. So I was kind of thinking about a backstory. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, Rohit, for the wonderful project that you've shared. It's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think it was really enjoyable to see that the way you have imagined um, the structure, um, mm -hmm. in some ways almost mimicking what is inside uh, within the sculptures, you know, the way it sort of uh, is is put together in the, in the overall uh, volumetric uh, uh, enclosure that you have made. Uh, so yeah, I think that's uh, one. Uh, my one point of concern was about uh, movable parts. Um, and whether it's the screens or the um, or the cover which moves, um, and their possible practicality uh, in in a context where maintenance is is, is a fairly major concern um, uh, to uh, you know to manage the buildings in the long run. So, mm -hmm. is it thought that you have? Um, um, because to me, to me, that was only something which, which looks beautiful, um, and is very light. So the lightness is commendable. But it's just that how to really take care of it um, is what I would like to think about. Uh, right. So I was thinking. Uh, so actually, uh, in the process of idol making, actually, the, all the mandals in the city are negotiating with the place to get their idol made. So I was thinking that these bundles can only come forward and work for the maintenance and the admin part of the building, such so that it becomes a point in the city where, from where this festival is being set up. So yeah, I, th I think if, uh, to commend you on the project, 
it's also about how um, a number of members are actually tensile and also shows the temporariness of, of this whole, uh, uh, you know, exercise, which is an annual, a fairly large business. Thank you for the lovely presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you, uh, panelists. And uh, we now move on to our next presenter, Sayukta Rajiv. Her thesis is on living heritage, Chanderi, and her thesis code number is B10. Uh, I'll share my screen now. Yes, please. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Samyukta Rajiv and my project is in a town called Chanderi in Madhya Pradesh. The, uh, the thesis started with the investigation of the built and the unbuilt heritage and how their interdependence will help in reviving and conserving these entities proving beneficial in initiating the town under the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Chandir is located centrally in India, in the state of Madhya Pradesh. To understand this town, Chandiri can be fragmented into, into three major elements. Chandiri Fort, the older inner town which is called the Andar Shahar, and the newer outer town which is called the Baha Shahar, which is located besides the main road separating the two halves. Some of the photographs of the town. The research explores two major impacts of the 15th century. One is the flourishing weaving tradition and the other is the water architecture that is the steppe wells. A proposal was sent to UNESCO wherein the town fulfilled two criteria concerning the weaving culture. However, there are currently issues faced by the communities and the steppe wells which have to be addressed to initiate the town as a UNESCO site. The weavers are not globally recognized and also there is a limited reach nationally. Inadequate weaver consumer direct interaction leading to a lack of knowledge and awareness about the Chandiri saris. Within the town, most of the livable spaces are taken up by the handlooms. And you can see that by comparing the houses of the Andar and the Bahar share. Andar share shows an equal ratio in the working and the living spaces, while the Bahar share has an unequal ratio. Bahar share has the potential to free up these spaces by introducing new handloom and workshop spaces. The architecture and how steppels have always shaped the social life of the people and how Chandiri came to be known as the land of steppels. However, there is a decline in this number from 1200 to just 190 and the reasons are steppels used as basements, some are sealed due to degradation, inability to use water due to garbage and other pollutants, certain steppels are used for bathing and washing clothes, poor soil conditions leading to the steppels inability to retain water, leaving very few used for domestic purposes. Andashair, that is the older town, has taken measures to restore the steppels. However, Bahashair, which has a number, considerable number of steppels, have the potential to be revived, restored, and brought back to the functional state. And hence, the Bahashair is taken as the site. The existing scenario and the proposed scenario of how the heritage of the town can be revived through strong communal engagement, leading to the site downtown being initiated as the UNESCO World Heritage Site. The five parameters for site selection are maximum density of the weaving community, maximum density of the steppers and the social spaces associated. The intervention must follow the heritage loop of the town. And also there's a Mela that is a festive ground which takes place during the month of March where it is celebrated for 20 days. Some of the photographs of the site. To understand the site and the relationship of the community further, the steppers have been measured wrong. Some are in need for repair, while few are in a dilapidated state unfit for use. The mapping the lives of the weavers on site and how men and women both look after the domestic needs of the family. The parent site caters to two major communities, one being the weaving and the other being the artisans engaged in small scale cottage industry. The intervention lies in close proximity to the steppers to increase their functionality so such that they do not remain in isolation. The two blocks lying on either sides of the bypass road are the workshop block and the weaving block. The workshop block is broken down into grains, into smaller grains to respond better with the step well and the lake. The weaving block 
has a larger grain with breakout spaces stuck between them both the blocks are situated in a place where it is closer for the people uh, to work and commute since the architecture is influenced by the process of weaving the hierarchy of the spaces also follow a similar fashion from dyeing to its sorting separating weaving and finally to the retail all connecting the social spaces around the stepwell since weaving is largely dependent on water intervention is uh, in close proximity to the lake and a buffer landscape zone helps in establishing a relationship of the people with the lake the intervention how it acts as a center for cultural heritage opening up a platform for celebrating these heritage entities weaving clusters are formed to increase the versatility and efficiency of the weavers also the landscape and the stepwells help keep the spaces cool throughout the site plan showing the basic context of the uh, and the grain of the town within which the intervention is built the ratio of the working spaces in the bahar share and the work and the spaces in the andar share the intervention lies next to the house khas tala connecting the three stepwells a linear circulation path connects all the three stepwells with working spaces on either sides the hierarchy of the spaces flows from a public domain to a larger community driven domain associated with the stepwell and further towards the private spaces composition of the workshop block is such that each block caters to a particular practice that is wood bamboo craft pottery and stone all all the activities spilling outside apart from the monsoon season in the shaded area near the stepwell reviving the sense of social space around it the weavers can bring their children to the workspace as a crèche is also being provided the uh, the weaving block has a reception on the left side which caters to the uh, workspaces being allotted to the weavers where they can punch their i cards daily as a person enters enters the building he can uh, he can experience the entire process of how a chanderi saree is being made which is not currently visible the weaving spaces are to the left side while the dyeing spaces are to the right side the dyeing uh, proposed uses vegetable peels as the natural ink instead of a synthetic ink which is being filtered by the dye wall and it recharges the constructed body lying next to it after that yarns are dried and dyed they are sorted and sent to the opposite side of the block where they are inspected for the quality of the dye they are then rolled manually and installed on the sari wall which for encloses the weaving block from one side forming a frontage to the lake the flexible arrangement of the sarees form an important elevation from the lake breakout spaces are dug between two uh, two weaving modules the uh, the shaded area interactive space held near the stepwell allows the public to create try weaving on their handlooms the weavers can cook and eat the food and can, and the entire space near the stepwell acts as a collective eating space out of the five weaving modules one of them is used as a learning space for people to continue and learn the art the space behind it acts as a crèche the third step where forms a large space for cultural gathering during festivals and other celebrations planet 4 meter shows only the weaving blocks as they are 6 meters in height this longitudinal section is cut through both the blocks and the bypass road the step where how it forms an important working space with uh, activities spilling outside and the weavers working with the sari wall as the backdrop the brick as a transitional medium between the inside and the outside the small blocks where the yarns are loaded under the rails the storage space for completed sari the bypass road acts as an entrance to the sari exhibition the craft exhibition and the intermediate collective working zone the section is to the bamboo and the stone workshop blocks and the step will engaging the community with the heritage the section cuts to the weaving block with the temple and a sandstone mausoleum in its context the sari wall acts as a transitional medium with not light flooding these areas enabling comfortable working environment the area where the yarns are dried and loaded onto the rails the last section cuts to the stepwell looking towards the weaving block where by the space around the stepwell acts as a collective eating space and the work spaces of the weavers housing three weaving mechanisms the charkha the chakra and the handle the 3d representation drawing of how the entire intervention works as a center for cultural heritage where the heritage of the town is preserved by the culturally rich weaving and artisan communities the weaving module can house up to 10 handlooms and 10 charkhas which has an isolated pad footing does not disturb the groundwater level of the site 
The beam structure comprises of truss spanning across two stanchions with the steel sari wall attached on one side, allowing easy interaction of the weavers on the other three sides with the public. The weaving model can be built, assembled and dismantled anywhere in the town to provide working spaces for the people near the residential houses. The, sand, the cross section of the weaving block. The sandstone masonry workshop block has a steel structure roof which can be dismantled allowing for extension in the future. The process of weaving includes the water from the step wells for dyeing and the vegetable peels as the ink. After they are dyed, they are loaded onto the rails which travel to the opposite side of the block where they are collected for further processing. They are then manually separated and then installed on a sari roll and then a sari wall. The warp threads from the charka and the weft threads from the charka both leading to the weaving of a chanderi sari and all spaces associated around a step well. The dye wall as an inlet for the wastewater having a capacity to dye 3600 saris at a given point of time and in case of demand the existing step can also be used. The section through the filtration pit to extract the color. The rails have a motorized mechanism and is composed of steel members and a PVC circular tube for smooth transition. A person can experience the colorful lianes moving along on the roof. The sari wall has a steel structure framework that can hold up to 28 sari rolls at a given point of time. So, Yuka, yeah, I would request you to stop. Your 10 minutes are up. What you could oh. do is you could just scroll through the remaining yeah. slides. Thank okay. you. So, I have to. I, I like to end it with uh, being an initiative from my side to create a brochure for Chandiri, which is not currently available. To uh, uh, spread the awareness about the built and the unbuilt heritage. Thank you. I would request the panelists to ask your questions, ask your suggestions. I can go first. Um, Samyukta, thank you so much for that lovely presentation. Um, it's one of the few schemes I felt like I could actually inhabit. I could actually, it's, it's very tactile. I could really feel like I could inhabit the project. I had a, I had a few more questions about the, the community aspect that you talked about. Um, and I wanted to learn more about, I suppose, um, you know, what this community is, you know, where they're coming from, are they sort of uh, permanent, you know, are, are they in permanent accommodation on site and you know, or, or if they're there for a period of time, how long they're there for, and so on and so forth. So if you can just tell me a little bit more about the, the social profile of the people who work there. Um, thank you. And uh, so the, the weaving tradition started from the 15th century. And since then, people over there are practicing handlooms and have not shifted to power looms because that's how they value their uh, art and culture over there. And the people there are permanent residents and the Andershai, which I said, the older town initially started practicing and then it shifted to the Bahar Shai gradually. So the people over in the Bahar Shai have um, set up small houses to accommodate these handlooms. So they, are, they have permanent residents, but my initiative was to free up the residential spaces by creating workshop spaces where the handlooms can be accommodated. And the Andershai uh, already has bigger houses and since it's an older, like it's a developed area. So they are permanent residents engaging in this practice for a really long time. Right, thank you. So how many hours a day, uh, how many hours a day do they work typically, the weavers? They work almost 18 hours, uh, 18 to 18 in case of a big order, but sometimes they work for 15 hours a day. Yeah, so the, yeah, that's my, that's, that's kind of the key to my question is that when we're talking about organized workspaces like that, and in, in some sense, even if you call it craft, it is a kind of a factory, you can, you can dress it up and call it craft, but it is a factory. Um, so, and, and I think it's interesting that you've taken it on the question. I think maybe you don't, you needn't have solved that, but I think just I, that I want you to think about is how you're humanizing that work practice and that workspace especially when you know a group of people are working 18 hours straight um, just just a thought you know uh, because 
there, there's a tendency to kind of really kind of romanticize these ideas of craft where the work is backbreaking labor. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in also people's well-being. So I'm just wondering if you would have, if you would in the future, if you had to come back to a project like this, kindly consider so all these aspects as well. Thank you. Thank you. Samyukta, thank you so much for your presentation and for your uh, project. I think uh, very strong and uh, very detailed, well-researched. Thank you. Um, my question was related to, um, let's say, the fragility of the site. It's a UNESCO site, of course. Um, it's very precarious in that sense. Uh, but on the other hand, you also have, uh, I have the feeling that you want to make something of a statement. You want to kind of show the importance of this, the history of it. Uh, the, um, the cultural uh, history of it and I was wondering if there was a tension during your design uh, project in which on the one hand you wanted to kind of create um, and design maybe a, a space that is much more kind of laid back and, and uh, just um, yeah, really respectful towards the site or if you were much more thinking about uh, making much more stronger statement in relation to the importance of this culture I was wondering if you came across this tension and if you could elaborate on this uh, to answer, the it's not a UNESCO site. I'm proposing that it should be a UNESCO site because um, the the art and culture, the heritage is st strong, like the tangible also, which includes the step wells and also the weaving tradition. So I'm proposing that it should be declared as a UNESCO site. So the parameter for, um, and, and that's why I wanted to create an, inter uh, an intervention or a form which celebrated and revived the step wells, which initially used to be a social space for the people. So the steppers over there right now are not being used and I'm proposing that it should be used and it and it, it it can be only done by the community living over there as they are directly dependent on it and also the culture that is the tradition that is the weaving is highly dependent on water. So by creating that sort of a um, interdependence of the people in helping to uh, preserve the heritage will be the uh, will be the base to this being declared as a UNESCO site. So I wanted it to not be a uh, just, a, just a structure to celebrate and not highlight the structure itself, but to highlight the importance of the heritage over there. Very clear. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Samukta, for uh, your presentation. Um, very interesting. Uh, and very appropriate in its location, uh, what it's trying to do. Um, um, I had just one question, which is not, not so much uh, uh, a bit connected to uh, your design scheme, which is about uh, geometry, the role of geometry and uh, in traditional architecture and whether it has uh, because uh, I just to put it in some perspective that uh, most of the time the uh, the traditional architecture, at least the ones which are more permanent or made in stone or more permanent materials, they follow follow fairly strict geometries and <clears throat> and flexibilities actually do not uh, modify the geometry. But in your case, when I look at it, so just a thought, it's, it's not a, a, a kind of a, a, a pointer directly, but something which sort of intrigues me that in, in a settlement and a, uh, working with a craft, which is far more traditional, um, would it make sense to look at this aspect of geometry and also uh, the other aspect will be about the ground and um, the shelter, just these two aspects, uh, where the ground would have greater character, uh, because that's what we touch and we walk on, um, uh, and its relation to um, just a shelter or just this idea of shade. So I, I want you to make your own connections, uh, because it, this is the thought which came to me while I was looking at your project. Um, thank you. And the reason I didn't want to um, stack it up because there was also a notion of creating a workspace which is an intermediary between the household level and also an industry level. And and the moment you stack it up, it just becomes an um, industry working environment. 
so the ground space was some uh, a way to engage the viewers with the public and also with the other artisans so that it, there can be a transfer of knowledge and the skill and one person and it 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 already exists in a part in the town where there is actually a person who specializes in one and thus um, he can or she can transfer it to others and i didn't the reason i built the weaving modules in a more of a uh, using steel actually because i also wanted to it be a module which can be uh, replaced or replicated anywhere in the town to provide immediate working spaces in case of an order and yes i uh, agree that there's a, a strong notion of how they already build those sandstone uh, the geometry that self itself um i've kept um i've kept i've tried to um, i don't know uh, to connect that sort of an architecture in the workshop block itself where the ground story is a more of a stone structure and to allow that flexibility of creating a lightweight structure in the future if they want to itself so the workspace can be extended to the upper level and it's not a permanent structure that's pro proposed right now uh, just a uh, quick uh, uh, short question Uh, what do you think about wood because that has uh, or at least was the kind of material which was used for a uh, lot of the buildings do you see this potential um, uh, or there is also an association um, a cultural association in in uh, traditional craft areas to work with such a material uh yes wood uh, actually has been used in terms of building the handlooms themselves but they have Uh, prove to be uh, it takes a lot of time so that they have already shifted those handlooms by building it in steel right now since wood is not available easily over there and bamboo in a way can be used because it it's used in abundance and that's why uh, most of the uh, there are bamboo weaving communities over there also because of the same reason so the in case of building anything as a light structure bamboo can be used as a alternative and other than wood thank you so much for taking us through your project thank you thank you sayukta and uh, thank you panelists we will now take a break and resume at 3:30 looking forward to seeing you all back online at 3:30